Hey, everybody with Beards and Bibles. We want to thank you guys for joining us today. We have a very special guest with us today. We have our pastor, Pastor Billy Shelton of Redemption Church in London, Kentucky. It must be remembered that we are in the preliminary stage of one of the greatest battles in history. That the air battle is continuous and that many preparations have to be made here at home. You ask, what is our policy? I will say, it is to wage war by sea, land, and air, with all our might, and with all the strength that God can give us. Uh, before we get started, Billy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what's going on at Redemption right now? Well, I have been the pastor of Redemption Church for its entire existence. We have been in existence for nine years now. Uh, my wife and I moved from Harlan County and established a Redemption Church. And we started very small with about seven people in a building that was really run down. And God just started moving and blessing. And over the last nine years, we have grown and God has accomplished so much. Um, right now, of course, nobody's in the sanctuary. We are doing our best to abide by CDC guidelines. So we are doing strictly online services and adapting to the environment that we find ourselves in. But I think that it is beneficial to us because we are learning how to reach more people using social media, using the internet, using all the instruments that the 21st century has provided us to communicate with other people. So we are excited about this season and also challenged by this season. And I am grateful to get the opportunity to talk with you guys today. Awesome, awesome. Well, we are extremely grateful that you could take some time out of your day to join us. Um, so yeah, you kind of already hit it on the head. Like the, the reason that we wanted to do this, uh, this interview with you today is during this whole situation with COVID-19 and the coronavirus, uh, which same thing, but uh, there's been a lot of changes in the world. And one of the things that I have noticed, and I think Johnny's noticed it too, is that people are asking a lot of questions right now. And we're seeing behaviors out of people that um, you wouldn't normally see. Uh, and when I say people, I'm talking about the Christian community at this time. So what we wanted to do today was we wanted just to uh, ask you some questions um, that you know we've been hearing and just some questions that we've come up with that are kind of related to this whole you know pandemic. And you know we wanted to get a uh, we wanted to get a pastor's point of view on not only uh, has as to how men should react to this situation, but as uh, how uh, Christians in general should react and, and, you know, maybe where our minds should be at and um, maybe just guide us in our faith a little bit during this whole thing, because it's, it's an unprecedented time for pretty much everybody in the world right now. So um, I think I'll go ahead and start. And Pastor Billy, the, the very first question that I want to ask you is a question that was asked to me um, literally just a couple of weeks ago. And when this person asked me about it, I mean, it really took me back. Um, I, I didn't know what to say at first. And I mean, of course I had an answer, but I wanna get your perspective on this. So the very first question that someone asked me when it came to um, Christians and, and faith and everything like that, and this came from a person that is not religious. They, they, they lean more on the atheist side. Um, but the question that they asked me was, do you think God did this? So what do you think about that? The short answer is no. The long answer is it doesn't really matter whose fault it is because I believe that God is sovereign. So anything that happens, he allows to happen to a certain extent. For example, when Job was about to be tried and tested by the enemy, before the enemy could go forward, he had to petition God for permission. And if we read that passage of scripture, we actually find 
that it was God who brought up Job's name. God said to the enemy, have you considered my servant Job? Which is very sobering. I've often told God, if he's having a conversation with the enemy, please leave my name out of it because I'm not looking for any unnecessary challenges or I'm not looking to prove my faith. I'm not looking to see how strong I am. But that was essentially the conversation. God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? So no matter whose fault it is, it does have to pass through the same hands before it happens in my life, before it is allowed to occur in my life. So I don't take the perspective that God calls this. Of course, nothing evil comes from God. God has never sinned. There is no unrighteousness in him. But at the same time, God is sovereign and God is all knowing. And if he understands that he can accomplish his purpose through the enemy's attack, then he will often allow the enemy to do what he has planned to do in order to fulfill his purpose through the enemy's activities. I like that. I like that. And so I guess what I would ask is a follow-up question to that um, is, you know, so obviously one of the things that we, that we read about in the book of Job was not only was God allowing uh, the devil or, you know, the enemy, whatever, whatever you want to call it to uh, test Job, but it was also kind of a way to, to let the enemy see and, and for God to prove Job's faith. Right. Okay. So, when it comes to faith, we're seeing right now, and I, I'm sure you've probably seen it just as much, but uh, if you go on social media, you are seeing, uh, you know, small little places here and there, a church in Virginia, a church down in Florida, uh, Louisiana, California, wherever, and, and these churches are saying, you know, we're not going to listen to the, uh, to what the government is telling us to do. We're going to go ahead and we're going to have these in-person church services and they see it as one of those things that like if they don't have those in-person church services like maybe they have less faith so do you think that that there is a correlation with the amount of faith that you have um when it comes to you know having a church service in person or you know doing like our church is doing which is you know doing online services I think there is definitely a balance that we have to strike in this season. Obviously, my church, the church that I pastor, isn't having services. So I don't see a direct correlation between having services and the amount of faith that you have. I do think that there is a balance that we have to strike in this season. Number one, I think anytime you ignore the consequences of a situation and purposely put yourself in a compromising, dangerous situation, that it falls under the category of testing God. I think that's essentially what the enemy said to Jesus, what the enemy asked Jesus to do. He took him to the pinnacle of the temple and he said, if you're the son of God, jump off because it's written that he'll give his angels charge concerning you and they'll lift you up before you hit your foot against the stone. What was the enemy asking Jesus to do? Put yourself in a dangerous situation in which you've ignored the potential obvious consequences and call it faith for the sake of seeing God move in your life and deliver it and deliver you from the circumstances that you create. So I think one side of it is if we push the envelope too much, if we ignore wisdom, knowledge, information, and we just err on the side of I'm going to do it because I have the faith to do it, then it ventures into the territory of testing God. But now on the other side of it, there's a lot of people being overcome with fear. I think if if you lay your head down at night and you can't sleep because you're wondering what surface you touch or who you accidentally inadvertently came in contact with or whether or not you've got a virus coursing through your system, I think that's the moment when caution is beginning to become fear and we know that the Bible said he didn't give us the spirit of fear, that we're not supposed to live in fear. We're not supposed to respond in fear. We're not supposed to allow our choices, our decisions, or our life to be influenced by fear. It's not that we don't feel it. It's that it doesn't control us, and we overcome it when it attacks our mind or our heart. 
Right. So, uh, so what's the difference between faith and wisdom then? I don't think they're two sides that are opposed to one another. I think they go hand in hand. Wisdom is acknowledging the situation you're in and adapting to it to the best of your ability. Jesus said, if you have faith, if you have belief that you could say to the mountain, be moved and cast to the sea. But before you can speak to the mountain, you have to see it for what it is. You have to address it for what it is. You have to be realistic enough to say, there's a mountain in my way. I have to have the wisdom to see what's in front of me. And then my faith allows me to overcome it or for it to be moved uh, out right. of my way so that I can continue to progress. I don't think there is a, a major difference. I think it's two sides of the same coin. They work together to fulfill God's purpose and plan. Well, I, me thinking of this, I'm thinking like when David fought Goliath, he wasn't scared of Goliath, as most of us can be scared of this virus. He had faith that God was going to take care of that giant, and you know there was no doubt in his mind. But there was there was no fear in him. He had hundred percent faith that no matter what he was going to be protected. So, and that's that's kind of he had faith and he used wisdom, knowing God was going to do it. And he wasn't scared of it, but now today we're kind of scared of it. We're just like, oh, well, we're just, we got to keep the churches open. There's got to be a place to go. As a Christian, I think we should be using our faith to reach people like, like how we are uh, over the internet, over uh, calling people, actually doing outreach, you know, instead of, you don't have to have the church open to reach people. And I think that that some people are in fear. And, you know, this is a serious situation, but we have to have wisdom to know not to mess with it. Let God take care of it. So uh, I, I think a follow-up question that I would have to to that because we we are talking about you know we, we've we've brought up fear and you know fear unfortunately can be a great motivator in a lot of people's lives on on which way they react i mean it's it's that you know that fight or flight complex that we get uh when something comes in and so the the flight part i've, I've seen people recently and i, I want to get your input on this pastor billy um there are a lot of people right now that are thoroughly convinced that this, this whole situation, this whole pandemic is actually a hoax. And not only are they convinced that it's a hoax, but uh, Christians in particular are convinced right now that the government is using this hoax as a way to shut down the church. So do you feel like, do you, would you agree with that? Would you grossly disagree? I mean, do you think that we're still living in um, a time where it's, you know, we're not necessarily being persecuted for being Christians, or are we going towards that vibe of, you know, underground churches in China? First of all, I'm making a general rule not to comment too much on things that I have no idea about. I don't know what the government is doing, which is generally true for most seasons of my life i have no idea what they are doing do i feel like they are purposely attacking the church in this season no i don't think that this could fall under the realm of persecution i don't think this is anything like what the first century church experienced in the days after jesus was resurrected but at the same time i am very unsettled in some cases, when I see certain stories about how local governments have pushed the envelope a little bit, I don't think that in America, there should ever be criminal charges pressed on someone for having church. Now, I understand the goal that they're trying to accomplish, but I feel like they can accomplish their goal without criminal charges. I mean, you position two state troopers at the that the opening of a parking lot and you send people away rather than to make somebody a martyr 
or uh, file charges against somebody. And the reason I say that is because I feel like once certain rights are infringed upon, it makes it easier for those rights to be infringed upon in the future for other reasons. But like I said, I don't feel like the government is targeting churches in this moment. They're dealing with an unprecedented situation and they're trying their best to get through it without, uh, without too many casualties. But at the same time, they have to be careful to not take too much liberty and authority in trying to accomplish their goals because there's a fine line between protection and prison. And I don't want to permeate over to the latter. I like that. I like that. Oh, before I ask too many more of my own questions, uh, Johnny, do you have, uh, do you want to throw in a couple of your questions real quick? Cause I mean, I feel like mine are just boom, 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 knocking them all out one in a row. Uh, what would you say to someone, uh, who's in fear about COVID-19? Like a non-Christian, what would you say to someone who's scared about this? First of all, I would say that the only way you're ever going to find lasting, consistent peace and contentment and fulfillment is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm. I would be afraid too if I didn't believe in him. Uh, I would be living in fear as well if I didn't know who he was. Secondly, I think that we have to remind ourselves of the sovereignty of God anytime we are overwhelmed with fear over this pandemic. God said that he was so in control that a sparrow cannot fall from the sky without his written permission. He said he's so involved that he numbers the hairs of our head. As long as I am not ignorant or as long as I don't ignore information that is available to me, then I have no reason to fear because anything else that would happen in my life, God has allowed it. And if God allows it, then somehow, some way, no matter how ugly or difficult or hard it may be, he's going to fulfill his purpose and plan through it. Okay. So why would, why would God allow it to happen then? That's a really good question. As a general rule, I try not to comment on things that I, I have understand. no idea about. Um, I don't know why God does some of the things that he does. That is far beyond my pay grade. Ironically, that's probably the most common question that I get as a pastor. Why would God do this? Why would God allow this? Why would this be God's plan? I'm not sure. I, I know that God's ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. Why would God allow Joseph to be thrown in a pit? Why would God allow Joseph to be sold as a slave? Why would God allow Joseph to be accused of rape when he did not touch the woman, but rather resisted her coming on to him? Why would God allow Joseph to be thrown in prison? Why would God allow the baker to forget all about Joseph or the butler rather to forget all about Joseph? I'm not sure, but I do know that when God fulfills his plan, it always falls into place in a way that you realize it was the best plan. It accomplished what was supposed to be accomplished. And then I think too, we have to take into uh, mind that God's perspective is much different than ours. God's number one goal is salvation, people being saved. And sadly, it's through hardship and difficulties that people tend to come to God. The prodigal son would not have come home. He wouldn't have, he would have never returned to the father's house had he not found himself broke, alone, and in the hog pit. Had his life not took that route, he would have never came back to his father. Well, but see, you answered that perfectly. I mean, basically, uh, you know, like like Job, he had it, he had it good before, and then, you know, God tested him. And then he let something happen, and he got even better at the end. So that's that's kind of the thing that I was that I was setting you up for. Even though we may be going through something, for those of for those who love God, it's going to be better in the end. So it, it kind of reminds me of the. Um, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of a, of a sermon illustration that you once had um, about the 
the idea of a bow and arrow um that resistance that resistance and that that uh those troubles that you're going through is just like that bowstring being pulled back and then uh god is literally using that resistance to let go that's where you let go of everything and god propels you forward into something greater and i believe that we are on the brink of the greatest outpouring that our generation has ever seen i believe that we are about to see God move in ways that we have never experienced before. The Bible says he's a present help in the time of trouble. Trouble sets the stage for God to preach his greatest message. And I believe that that's exactly what we're going to witness in this season. I already see it beginning to happen in my own church. We have been pressed to buy cameras. We have been pressed to improve our online presence. And we are reaching more people than we ever have. There was at, there was at least 10 times the amount of people that viewed our online service this past Sunday that would have seen our service had we just gathered in one location. So God is already moving and working through this. I liken it unto when Stephen was stoned. Stephen was stoned and the church was scattered. The church was forced to leave Jerusalem. And then what happened? Revival started breaking out everywhere in small towns and communities all over the nation of Israel and all over the continent of Europe. And I think that's some of the things that we're going to begin to see is God moving through this and extending the reach of the church. Let me ask one more question before you get to one, Andy. What's some pros and cons about your church service or, or about Sunday uh, like that has happened since this virus has hit? Like, What's some things that you've learned to like uh, getting better at and what's some things that you kind of miss? I'm not, allowed, I'm, I'm not sure that a pastor is allowed to say this, but it sucks not having people. Not sure that we're supposed to say sucks, but it, it sucks not seeing people, not seeing their facial expressions, their body language, not being able to put my hand on somebody's back in agreement with them, not being able to see tears of repentance, not being able to see countenance change, not being able to see smiles on people's faces. That's what I miss the most. Now, one thing that I am improving at is just being able to speak to the camera and knowing that more people are going to view that message than would have ever attended my church on that specific day. Knowing that I am being allowed into living rooms and bathrooms and bedrooms and closets that I would have never had access to before, knowing that God is taking his message further than I could even imagine. I think that is a pro that if you'll embrace this, if you'll embrace this season and do your best to adapt to it as a church and as a pastor, when we do get together again, you're going to notice that your congregation is a little bigger than it was before. And we will be better off coming out of this than we were coming into it. Hey man, that is awesome. That is awesome. That is a great, that that's a great answer right there. That I absolutely awesome. love that. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Pastor Billy, I think one last question that we want to ask for you, uh, ask you is um, not only, you know, as a pastor, you've been affected, but as Christians, we have also been affected. And, and when I say as Christians, I mean, just your general lay people. Um, so I think what I want to ask, and this is a question I think a lot of people have on their minds is what should I be doing as a Christian uh, during this pandemic? What should I be doing, um, you know, not only in my personal life, but when it comes to my church, my community, um, what, what kind of things would you recommend uh, to kind of help us keep growing in our faith, but also keep being the church, not the building, but the church, the body of believers? I think number one, you treat this season as a season of solitude. In the Bible, every great move of God was preceded by a season of solitude. 
before the children of Israel stepped into the promised land and received everything that God said they could have, there was 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years in solitude before Jesus jumped off the balcony of heaven and into the womb of a virgin and came to save us from our sins, there were 400 years of silence, 400 years of solitude before John the Baptist ignited revival. He was in the wilderness all by himself in solitude before Jesus started his ministry and turned the world upside down in three and a half years. He was 40 days and 40 nights in solitude. In Acts chapter 2, before the rushing mighty wind, before 3,000 souls were saved, they were three days in prayer and fasting, three days in solitude. Before John wrote the book of Revelation, he was on an island by himself in solitude. So focus on your prayer, focus on your studying, focus on fasting. Focus on drawing close to God because I believe that he wants to prepare you for what's happening next. I believe that God has used this season of shutdown to invite you into a place of solitude to prepare you for what he wants to do in your life and through your life. And as far as how can you continue to make an impact, how can you continue to bless others? If you're a minister, do some online devotionals. Do some videos. Use the resources that we have. I have often said that if Paul had the internet, the whole world would have been saved. If he didn't have to spend weeks and months going from city to city, if he could have pushed a button and had access to thousands, if not millions of people, he would have turned the world upside down. So use the resources that you have. Even if you're not a minister or a pastor or a preacher, share your testimony online. Tell people what Jesus has done for you. Make a video, get it out there so that you can impact people's lives. And then thirdly, just be there. Text somebody, call somebody. How you doing? Yes, we are separated, but we're not shut off from people. We're not isolated from people. You can pick up a phone and Ask somebody how they're doing, how their day is going, how their family is faring in the midst of all of this. You can still be a part of people's life. You just have to do it in a new and different way. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, I think that that's, that's awesome advice right there, Pastor Billy. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's all the questions that we've got for today. And um, uh, first and foremost, Billy, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this, uh, this interview today and for taking some time out of your day once again. Uh, we really appreciate the answers that you've given us, and, and we're hoping that this video can be used to propel not only men, but just Christians and people in general um, to a deeper, further relationship with God, uh, especially amidst all this crisis that's going on. So I want to thank you once again for joining us. And um, I think that's it. What about you, Johnny? Uh, well, I just got an alert that said something about a time limit. So I was going to say, is there anything else that like you wanted to add or like just a question that you had for us or whatever? Two things really quick. I've heard a lot of people say that this pandemic is in somehow the wrath of God or the judgment of God coming upon the face of the earth. And I don't believe anything could be further from the truth. Truth, because when Jesus was on the cross, he was judged for my sins. The wrath of God was poured out on him on my behalf. So the judgment of God and the wrath of God are no longer aspects of my life because I am saved. And for anybody else that's saved, the wrath and judgment of God is no longer an aspect of your life because of Jesus' sacrifice. So don't buy into that. Don't let people convince you that God is against you and he is judging you for your sins. Because if you are in Christ, your sins have already been judged through Christ. On a lighter note, number two, the thing I miss the most is just getting a haircut. My beard is going crazy. It looks like it's got the mange in certain places. I got twigs 
sticking out in every direction and I can't find anybody to break the rules. I can't find one underground barber who will let me come to their house and who will fix me up, which really sucks because I recently became a televangelist, as you know, and I need to look good on TV. Well, that's why like Andy, he, he got tired of waiting for a barber and he just burned his off. I just went for it. I figured I was like, by the time that it grows back, the shops will open again. So, you know, I just went with it. And it's it's paid off mostly. I think I look pretty good as a semi-bald dude. So I'm going to rock it. I mean, like, Billy, you got like this John Cooper thing going on, man. Like, Carrie's going to be thinking she's going to go into bed with the lead singer of Skillet. I mean, I just roll with it. I never noticed that. That is true. <laughs> he's he's not a bad dude. I mean, I, I that's a compliment. He, he's not a bad looking dude. But appearances can be a little deceiving. I did steal my wife's Ricky mirror, which she uses for her makeup videos, <laughs> in order to get the proper lighting for this video. Well, that's your all good. lighting looks good. Your lighting looks good. All well, right. Billy, well, I think that's all we've got. You know, I think it's all the time we got for today. <laughs> Uh, we love you. We appreciate everything that you do for us. And uh, we hope to have you back on soon. Um, who knows how long this uh, coronavirus thing will last. Maybe the next step of it will bring you back on. Or... Just thank you so much, man. It's thank been you, a Pastor pleasure. Billy. We appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. Let me know anytime. I'll come back and do it again. All right. Thanks, we'll brother. Do. Guys, that's all we got for today. Thank you all for joining us and sticking with us this long. And until the next time, stay beardy. Stay bearded.